Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Lois. Hi, Jacob. Hi, David. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, back to our regular scheduled program. Hello. Hi, Jacob. Hi. Okay. I'm on uh, Sunday mornings. I study with a young man who's in Israel. He's a guy from Northbrook, but he's been studying in Yeshiva in Israel. So we're studying a work by the Chazanish called Emuna and Bitachon. And he has a chapter in this. It's, a, it's more like a booklet or a, a little booklet, uh, but it's an oft cited work. Um, he was a world-renowned scholar. He grew up and was trained and already developed a reputation in Vilna, in Lithuania, um, and then um, moved to Israel. And he's credited with um, sort of bringing back the study of laws that apply in Israel, where uh, for a couple thousand years, there hadn't been a real, um, there'd, there'd always been theoretical study of, of the laws uh, that apply in Israel. And certainly there's books like, like the Rambam and others where they codified this, but there wasn't a lot of like contemporary halachic discussion about the laws and especially where a farmer would get a pack you know a practical sense a guide on on how to go about his business in israel when you're dealing with the agricultural produce because there's so many um agricultural laws um so one of the areas of law that he's credited with um with sort of reestablishing are those laws. Uh, but really, he's, he's really a very important halachic figure. Um, he, uh, when Reb Chaim Soloveitchik's book on the Rambam came out, he wrote a, a critical, sort of like the Rivet on the Rambam. Uh, so he wrote a kind of critical gloss on, on Reb Chaim's book uh, and so you can buy Reb Chaim on the Rambam with the criticism of the Chazanish. And there's just uh, uh, just many areas of the law um, which he, ha he has a kind of stamp on um, and sort of reestablished Israel as a very important world-class scholarship, uh, a place for, uh, of scholarship on law. Um, so he's living there in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and so he wrote this little book and he's talking about <coughs> scholarship. And he it's it amounts to what in present day we would call a rant against a phenomenon that he uh, and was encountering a kind of shift in um in rabbinics, where there was a shift towards people who were inspiring speakers um, and more towards what we would call Musr and Hasidus away from Halacha. And his rant, in quotations, was that that you never, in other words, that it, it always has to be somehow, a, a person's studies always have to somehow be uh, 
connected to halacha. Obviously, studying matters that bring you more awe of God and inspire you are important, but the but the root of your learning and the root of your knowledge has to be from halacha, and that the ultimately the study has to bring you to a a, a the a understanding of like the deepest underpinnings of of the halacha represented um and it sort of reminds me also of rabbi salavechik's uh rabbi joseph bear salavechik's halachic man uh and certainly it seems to be also have been rabbi salavechik's worldview that um whatever you're studying there is some kind of rooted um relationship to what we would call halacha um and that out of a tell so he could be talking about a subject which is philosophical or theological but he would show you how somehow uh we find the the basic principles of the notions that we're using in some halachic discussion or some manner of halachic discussion that somehow uh, it always boils down to some kind of halachic understanding that um, so I just uh, since we're doing the Sefer on mitzvos and we're encountering this that we could be having a discussion about a law but then we get into involved in some kind of broader conversation which is sociological or or political or um but somehow it started with an attitude that came from the law. Um, and I, I, because of my several years of going on trips with pastors and encounters with Christians, that notion, that line of theirs, that Christianity is about love and Judaism is about law. And that's kind of pejorative. Um, I don't know just thinking about that okay um so we we're talking about wiping out a malek and now we have the mitzvah to remember what a malek did to us that is that he commanded us to remember what a malek did to us in its coming forward to do us evil to hate it at all times to arouse the spirits with statements to fight with it and to make the nation alacritous to hate it. So actually alacritous is that word zrizus, zrizut, which means you're proactively hating it. You're not just responding to an outbreak of a malek or you're not just responding to the mention of a malek, but you're proactively remembering a malek. It's on your mind always, and not just, um, uh, you know, from the from the Rambam. It's it's you it's you're thinking about it to be motivated to do something about it, uh, such that the commandment not be forgotten with the passing of so much time, and that is his may he be exalted saying, "Remember what Amalek did to you." Uh, this is one of what they call the six remembrances. And a lot of Sidurim at the end of the Siddur, they have a list of things where the Torah told us to remember it. There are six of them all together. Uh, and this is one of them. Um, perhaps only in your heart when it states, you shall not forget, behold, that is forgetting of the heart. So what do I establish with remember? That hatred for it be in your mouth. In other words, you should speak about your hatred of it. You shouldn't just think about, and uh, not your remembering of it, not your hatred, but you should speak about what they have done. Uh, you speak about your hate of it. You speak about your plan to wipe it out. Um, the hatred for it be in your mouth. Uh, do you not see that at the beginning of Shmuel's doing this commandment, how he first mentioned its evil acts and only then did he command to kill them. So it's not just about even killing them. It's about remembering what they did and then killing them. 
And that is his, may he be blessed, saying, I have remembered what Amalek did to Israel. So this is this great irony, which is that the previous mitzvah was to wipe out the memory of Amalek. Uh, as it, this was in the previous mitzvah, he writes, um, that is, he commanded us to exclusively cut off the head of Amalek, males, females, adults, and children from among the rest of the descendants of Esau, and that is his may be abolted, saying, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek. So that's 2519, to wipe out the memory of Amalek, and in two verses earlier, it says, remember what Amalek did to you. So you could say that First, you have to remember what it did to you until you wipe out the memory of it. In other words, if you're successful, you won't need to remember it anymore. That you you remember it, then you wipe them out. And when, it, when you're blotting out the memory of it, you could say that in some ways you're erasing the need to remember it. Again, the original sort of conundrum is you're saying remember it, and then you're saying, wipe out the memory of it. And many people will have, have commented, <coughs> nobody would even know about Amalek if it wasn't us, for us. We're the ones who, who kept the notion alive. If we had just let things be, Amalek would have been forgotten. So, but the point is not that it should it, it should be forgotten, but rather it should be wiped out. And that when you're blotting out the, the memory, it's because there's no more need to remember it, something like that. Um, uh, I saw yet yeah, last night, there was, there's a group of us who study um, this work called Attached. It's uh, written by uh, a rabbi who lives, I think he lives in Skokie or West Riders Park. His name is Yaakov Danishevsky, Rabbi Yaakov Danishevsky. He's a therapist now, but he was a member, I think he was a member of the YU Kolo, a very nice man and a deep kind of thinker. He wrote this book, Attached, which is um, using the model of a relationship between husband and wife to explore a relationship with God. A lot of the issues, he's a therapist, he deals with um, husbands and wives in therapy. And um, he was suggesting that a lot of the work between husbands and wives is the work in a relationship with God. Um, it's, and it's thoughtful and interesting. Um, but he has this take on this. It doesn't fit the Rambam. His, his take, uh, honestly, we were sort of challenging him last night uh, whether or not it fits, it really even fits the language of the Torah, but he was suggesting the following. Um, using doubt, that there are some people who one of their issues is doubts are always creeping up in their mind. They can't help it. They're always doubting. And in, in a marriage, this can be very hurtful very problematic if he's doubting his wife you know let's say it's a husband doubting the the um his his wife's uh trustworthiness you know like he, he's always doubting doubting what she's saying doubting their relationship overthinking it um uh so he uh so he he confessed that he has this is an issue that he has and he had to work on early in his marriage so he, for him, the method that worked was something that you hear a lot uh, when people talk about meditation, which is that you notice, you, what you do is you look at the thing, you notice the thing. And by just looking at it, you take out some of the bite you take out some of the potency, you take out some of the sting of the thing itself so that it no longer has the effect that it regularly does. So this is something that I've used for many years in, in prayer. 
one of the great challenges to prayer is thoughts. You start to, let's say, you begin the Amida, and within a few seconds, you start to be thinking about things. Um, and then your thoughts take you off somewhere, and you only realize that a minute or two later that you've been wandering off in your own thoughts, and you're not paying attention to the words. You're not paying attention to the prayer. So um, this is a meditative technique, but it, it's Ari Kaplan has suggested, others suggested, and I've been using it for years, which is that you, what happens is you at some point notice your thinking, and then you just sort of see the thinking in your mind. You just see yourself thinking, and you go, oh, I'm thinking, or that's thinking. And then you sort of just let it be there for a moment, and then you gently go back to uh, to your davening. The reason you do this is because if you if you struggle with the fact that you're thinking, it gets even deeper than the thinking itself. It, it, you get way... It's way uh, farther away from what your goal was. Your goal was to be in um, a kind of contemplative um, dialogue with God. And you're uh, instead just in your mind wrestling with thoughts. So uh, feeding those are, thoughts, those are thoughts. You're feeding those thoughts when you're, you yeah, know, yeah. instead yeah. of just letting them flow. 100%. So he is suggesting something like that, that he used this with his doubting. In other words, he, he, um, he encounters doubt. He, it, he starts doubting and he know, and obviously at first when it's going on, you don't even realize it's what's going on. You're just so involved with it. And then now you're, you have a moment where you realize, Oh, I'm, there's that doubting again. So now, instead of questioning the doubting or or wondering about the doubting or all these things, you just notice, there I am, I'm doubting, or there's doubting, and you sort of notice it, and then you gently move back to what you're doing, and in other words, or gently move in. Now, he, he was th saying it, it, it needs another step, which is somehow engaging in the relationship again. You can't you can't just stay in thinking you need to you need to so let's say it's with your marriage and you're doubting your wife's fidelity so you would you would or her sincerity or whatever you're doubting so you you just notice that you're doubting and you just go oh there's doubting and then you'd find some way to maybe you'd call and and just speak to your wife or or do something but you you actually re-engage um, in the relationship so there's like noticing it and then gently re-engaging noticing it gently re-engaging that was a method he was using and he was suggesting that that this is a version it does not fit the rambam's language over here because the rambam is talking about passion the rambam's not just talking about noticing and then gently moving back but he was suggesting this with doubt the reason he's bringing up doubt is because in Hasidic literature, a Molik represents doubt. In, in Midrash, it, it represents doubt, but in Hasidic literature, very strong. And 40 days before Purim, every year in Breslov, they focus on a Molik and doubt. In other words, Purim is like the day of a Molik, is like the day we wipe out a Molik. And so 40 days before, they are working on the notion of doubt. So we are you know, less than 40 days uh, before Purim. So now in Breslov, they're working on, on this notion of doubt. They associate doubt with Amalek because that's uh, how it's understood that Amalek is sowing the seeds of doubt in mystical teaching and in, and in Hasidic teaching. And so uh, this... What does that mean? It means that even, um, like, for instance at the the uh, right after we have what you would call absolute clarity in our relationship with god because we've seen the plagues of the miracles and we've seen the splitting of the red sea so we've 
we've seen God's hand and we have absolute clarity, they jump in and they're, they're jumping in is meant to, this is how it's seen sort of a mystical teaching. They're jumping in to sow the seeds of doubt. So they, they jump into the water in the Midrash. It says the, um, imagine a, like a bath of boiling hot water, really hot water. It's too hot for somebody to go in. So some guy just jumps in and allows himself to be scalded so that everybody else can eventually jump in because by jumping in, he cools it off. So he, the other people, nobody would attack because not only the Jewish people saw everything of God, no, everybody else saw and heard about it. So nobody's going to attack the Jewish people. But once one person jumped in, even though he lost, it somehow gives just that little bit of permission for other people to start jumping in. So in that, the, you know, the Midrash doesn't overtly say it's about doubt, but that's how it's developed more in mystical teachings and especially in Hasidic teachings that Amalek um, represents doubt. And if so when you're encountering a Molek, one of the ways to encounter a Molek, let's say within ourselves, is to encounter doubt. So what Rabbi Danishevsky was saying is, when you encounter something like that within yourself, as he had to be, it wasn't doubt about God, but it was doubt about his relationship with his wife. But when he's, when he's uh, uh, working on encountering it, it's in that way where you, you notice it. That's what he's he's saying. This is what when when you say remember a Molek. So he is suggesting in practice what you do is you notice it. You notice it. You notice the doubt when it emerges. You notice it. That's the remembering. And then the wiping out doesn't literally mean to completely make it go away, but it means to defang it. To to. By, by noticing it and letting it hang there, it loses its potency. Now, he is borrowing poetically from the language because, again, as you see from the Rambam over here, the Rambam is, is, is characterizing it as anything but just, you know, letting it hang there and defang it. He's talking about a remembering that is proactive. It is hate-filled. It is with a design to destroy what he is giving it obviously a real poetic touch and suggesting especially you know in the in the approach towards doubt which is the hasidic approach oh, like he is suggesting more of a defanging you're going to notice it let it sit there for a minute it it loses its bite and then you move on. And so he wrote it. And then uh, last night, because a lot of people were having trouble seeing it in the language of the Pusuk, uh, Josh Nankin, who's one of the guys from the class, videotaped us uh, characterizing what he was describing. And then, um, and then with our question that it doesn't seem to be exactly in the language. So, and then he agreed that we are characterizing his thing correctly. He didn't have a good answer for how it's not, because it also makes it sound like you, it's your macho timchad zecher amalek makes it sound like you're erasing it. It's true, even after you erase, there's a mark that you've erased it, but erasing doesn't sound like just defanging something. It sounds like so, but anyways, his his notion I think is an interesting one, uh, and an interesting approach to this, as maybe from the from the Hasidic kind of wrestling with uh, the this mitzvah, exactly what does it mean? So he is suggesting poetically that when it says remember it, it means just like call it to view. You know, it's just look at it for a moment. And then let it let it just sort of fade. 
But when you do that, it doesn't, it isn't completely erased. It's just not toxic. It's not powerful. But so, so we'll call it a poetic reading of this. Um, and again, the conundrum of how do you erase it and remember it at the same time. So I'm suggesting a, a kind of simple mean, a simple answer to it, but there's a lot of people that work with this. One of the suggestions last night was that um, they, it was sort of like they love the paradox of it. You know how like um, Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead at the same moment. It's like this paradox of quantum mechanics that, that you, two things could be true that even though paradox, they shouldn't be able to be, but somehow two things can be true at the same time. So Schrodinger was originally using this as a joke. He was, he was, it was a criticism of quantum mechanics, but it became like a sort of the proud banner of quantum mechanics, which is that something could could be both alive and dead at the same and it, it's both are true it's alive and dead at the same moment so uh we got to talking about yitzchak at the akeda at the at the binding of isaac um so the you know when we read the binding of isaac we read that avram was prepared to kill yitzchak but at the last minute his hand was stopped. He, he, and and he did not kill Yitzhak, and that's how we're taught to read it. And that, if you look at almost all the commentaries, you are directed to read it that way from the commentaries. But if you read the text carefully, you you do you are not forced to read it that way. You could read it with the assumption that he actually did slaughter Yitzhak. Um, it, it, there's there's ways of, of reading the text. If you start with the assumption that he did in fact slaughter Yitzchak, you will not find anything that contradicts that. Uh, even when it says, when the angel tells Avraham, usually we, in our minds, we remember the angel saying, don't uh, slaughter him. But he doesn't actually do say don't slaughter him. He says, don't reach out your hand to the boy. Now, this, this could be after he slaughtered him that he's being told, you know, I don't want you to touch him. Leave him there. No, he slaughtered. Just leave him there. Don't do anything more with him. And when it says he brought the ram in place of his son, it doesn't actually say in place of his son. The word is tachaspano, which literally means underneath his son. In other words, you could read the text that he actually did slaughter him. We are not directed to read it that way. It's not the traditional way of reading it but you could read the text that he actually did slaughter him. And then you will find that in mystical writings, they, they will use language that he did in fact slaughter uh, Yitzchak. Uh, there's, there's an allusion in our liturgy in Yom Kippur to what are called the ashes of Yitzchak, ashes of Yitzchak, that, he, that Yitzchak was actually burned on the altar. Um, and you have the textual things that on the way to the mount, it says that, and it keeps on mentioning that Yitzhak and Avram went together. They, and the two of them went together. But after the Akeda, it just says Avram returned to the boys. It doesn't say anything about Yitzhak. We have no, uh, at the uh, burial of Sarah, no mention of Yitzhak being there. Um, all right. So then you'll ask, well, of course, Yitzhak, he didn't kill Yitzhak because Yitzhak is alive. So Yitzchak is alive and is going to get married and is going to have children and has several dramas that are recorded in the Torah. So the so this then in in mystical writings you, you understand understand how Yitzchak becomes the symbol for what we call resurrection of the dead, resurrection of the dead. So he that means he died and he was resurrected now even the people who say that he was not killed still think of him as resurrection of the dead but they would say it's figurative in other words he for all intents purposes he, he's not physically slaughtered but he's emotionally slaughtered and you, you'll see all sorts of writings like that 
that and they and you'll you'll see them find evidence of the fact that he was traumatized even his blindness uh, at towards the end of his life is credited to in the midrash is credited to the tears of the angels that drip when uh, at the Akeda. So even so, but somehow he represents resurrection. But in this discussion of uh, Yitzchak at the Akeda, you could say that Yitzchak at the Akeda is also one in this situation where he's both alive and dead at the same time. He's both alive and dead at the same time. And he's, and uh, so you, you could have these kind of uh, sort of paradoxes. Um, you also have uh, Rabbi Foreman. He says this about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of the good and evil. So we're told that uh, in the Torah that if somebody eats from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that he will die. You will die. That's what Adam is told. If, when you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. So, so Rabbi and also we're told that there's something called the tree of life. And it seems like that if you eat from the tree of life, you will be immortal. You will not die. So you have the tree of life. If you eat from that, you will not die. If you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. So Rabbi Foreman asks, so Adam and Eve, before they eat from the tree, are they alive? Are they mortal or are they immortal? Are they mortal or are they immortal? If they're mortal before they eat from the tree, then eating from the tree doesn't do anything to them. They're told when you eat from the tree, you're going to become mortal. You're going to be subject to death. So, um, and that's how we understand it. The Ramban says that's what it means. It doesn't just mean you're going to die that day. It means you're subject to, you're mortal. You're subject to death. So let's say according to the Ramban, so that means that before they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, then they were immortal. So if they're immortal, then what was the purpose of the tree of life? Because it says if you cling to the tree of life, you're immortal. Uh, so if they were already immortal, what do they need the tree of life for? So... He, he suggests that, and, and you might say they need the tree of life in case they, as an antidote for eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but God doesn't let them. He keeps them away from it after they eat the knowledge, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So he clearly didn't set it up as an antidote if he kept them away from it. So he, want, he wanted to suggest that you're in this state. You're in this kind of state where you're both mortal and immortal. And, and or at least you're in the state of potential of mortality and immortality. You're in some kind of state where you're in some state where you're either both or not yet either. But it's also one of these kind of like weird in-between states. And it's only after you choose one or the other that you become so sort of defined. But otherwise you're in some kind of kind of state like that so jerry gore last night was suggesting something like that for the remembering and wiping out that the goal is both that you you have like this kind of paradoxical thing you're supposed to both remember and wipe out remember and wipe out remember and wipe out so those are a collection you could say that none of them are really both uh, and you could argue about it or not and disagree about whether there's a category like this, but we had for a moment at least the option that there might be a category of things that somehow contain the opposites and uh, it's somehow okay. You could be both alive and dead at the same moment. You could be both remembering and wiping out the memory of something at the same moment. That's another option. And there's many options in between. Rabbi, if yes. 
uh, probably this was discussed last night too. If if it is a mitzvah for each person to do it, you would have to remember to wipe them out in order to do that. Yes, practically speaking, but <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't know to do it. Right. So you'd have to keep the memory going in order to know to do it. That's why I'm saying the first explanation is that the mitzvah to remember it is only until you've done it. Once you've done it, that's how you wiped out the memory. In other words, you eventually, mocho timcha et zecher amalek, the two verses later, you're going to wipe them out. And then you're not just wiping out the memory of them, but you're wiping out the mitzvah or the need to remember them, something like that. All righty. I was doing a lot of talking there. Sorry about that. All right. We are, uh, I look forward to the fact that we'll be learning again tomorrow. I'm very grateful that we got a chance to connect with each other and that you put up with me just then. And I look forward to much more of it. All right. Be well, guys. Okay. Goodbye, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank right. you. Bye-bye.